Welcome back. Tonight we're going to continue with our Puerto Rico Rises series. In fact, it has now been 100 days since Hurricane Maria tore through the island. And in Puerto Rico, despite its rich and fertile land, the farm to fork movement, which we know is staked to claim here in Sacramento due to our region's heavy agriculture economy, is relatively new there since the island lost its agricultural economy decades ago. After Hurricane Maria, food dependence became an obvious and serious issue. So the question is, what happened to their produce and why does Puerto Rico import only almost all of the food consumed on the island. ABC 10's Lilia Luciano takes us through the history, the current state, and the future of the island's food autonomy. The economic structure of Puerto Rico rests on a highly specialized agricultural system based on external trade relations. Sugarcane is king, the principal source of income. We started growing tobacco many years ago, as my grandmother told me. Somebody gave me a little plant of tobacco, and she recognized it, and she talked to me about her tradition. She would. And then she teach me how to dry it and how to use it. Samuel is one of many Puerto Rican farmers affected by Hurricane Maria, which hit Puerto Rico three months ago. We met Samuel through Tara Rodriguez Besosa and her Solidarity Bus, or Guagua Solidaria. The project, funded by the Puerto Rico Resilience Fund, will take brigades of agroecology experts around the island to rehabilitate and jumpstart about 200 farms in 24 months. And so it's the full circle. We give them seeds, we buy whatever veggies Their they food. have, we cook the veggies, we give the food to the volunteers, and we're trying to like restart. Yeah and you got like an economy. About seven years ago, Tara created a CSA project that connected farmers to consumers across the island and was running the only fully local and sustainable sourced restaurant in Puerto Rico. But when Maria forced her to shut it down, she took the kitchen and operations on the road with the brigade. It was very apparent to me that, you know, aid was going to be slow and... Canned. Canned, <laughs> to not say... While Tara and Vero popped up the community kitchen, volunteers worked hard on the farm rehab. I have to be honest, I have not done any kind of farm work. And there's something so cathartic, you know, about not just, you know, farming, but just get a feel of how individuals are, you know, literally rebuilding from the ground up. Yams, yaltias, and a large variety of other vegetables and fruits are grown for domestic consumption. Canned crappy food is not a hurricane-related problem. It's what a large part of the Puerto Rican diet consists of, and a lot of what I was brought up on. Puerto Rico's agroeconomy has been long lost. Before Maria, Puerto Rico imported 85% of the food it consumed. I became an agronomist in a time that there were no jobs in agriculture. How did we lose agriculture in Puerto Rico? Globalization. In 1940, 59% of all exports were agricultural products. Of this, 90% was sugar. During the first half of the 20th century, Puerto Rico's farmlands and agricultural workforce were exploited for the production of sugar, controlled by American companies. Starting in the late 1940s, under Operation Bootstrap, the U.S. incentivized American companies to launch operations in the island, creating an industrial economy and leaving the agroeconomy behind. That transformation from agricultural to industrial meant a reduction in the jobs that were available in the island. My, my father's parents were the first one to get here. My mother came from Cabo Rojo, from the, other, from the south side of the island. So a lot of people ask me, how did they meet? They met, uh, I usually call this the melting pot of Puerto Rico, because all of our people that left the countryside came, ended up here, either to go to the airport, take a plane, or just to stay here living, make a living. Jose Caravaggio, who lives in Caño Martín Peña, a settlement still forgotten and extremely poor that was founded by the families of those who came from the countryside looking for work in San Juan. It was a jumping off point for many in the mass migrations of Puerto Ricans to the mainland in the mid-century. A lot of people say you know, the history was that our people left the countryside to come here and look for work. I, I, I look at it the other way. We didn't, the government didn't build schools in the countryside. They didn't build hospitals in the countryside. So our people had to leave, maybe to find work, but I think it was also to find better health and better education for their kids. And it sounds to me uh, uh, more reasonable. They just come to look for work because in the countryside they had work. They, they, were, they were farmers. <laughs> 
For many of those farmers, the wisdom wasn't lost. They just had to trade it for opportunity elsewhere. They actually took Puerto Rico and south of Puerto Rico to grow food in New Jersey, in Connecticut. It's not an exodus when, when you, you're taking it. It's an extraction. It's an extraction. The phasing off of tax incentives and policies like the Jones Act, which deprives Puerto Rico from direct commerce with countries other than the U.S., have depressed the economy and made the cost of living very high for Puerto Ricans. The solution for so many, and more so after Maria, is to make use of their American citizenship in the mainland. We're just so concerned about our family that we don't care whatever we have to do to survive. Yeah. Doesn't matter if I need to go in the place they don't want me, in the place they've been telling me I'm not welcome. I go there. For my family, I do whatever it's needed. You know, we leave with that kind of dream that mm -hmm. the kid is going to be Lin Manuel Miranda. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you or know? Or Sonia Sotomayor. Or Sonia Sotomayor. Yeah. Or JLo. Or JLo. Y la tierra nunca deja de llamar. <laughs> Never. Many hear that calling and return, like Samuel after he graduated UC Berkeley, and Tara after becoming an architect in New York. And so did Jose's father in the 60s. He came back in 63, and they stayed here. They both stayed here in Puerto Rico. They came back to, to their country. And it's real nice to be in your country, where you were born, where your mother was born, and live where your parents live, where your kids live, where your grandkids have. I've lived. It's, it's been an uphill battle, but it's, it's been a good life. It makes me really emotional. Well, because I think about uh, when I have. It, it is, you know, it is. So, where does Puerto Rico take off from here? For Samuel, he'll keep on farming tobacco in the hopes that his son can get a fair shot in a Puerto Rico with less inequality. Tara's goal is 50% food autonomy for the island in the next 10 years. So once you get into the practice, okay, there's going to be a hurricane again next year. Yeah. We just got to know how we're going to bounce back and how to best prepare and how to grow our food in between and be happy. I think that um, one of the decisions that we've made for many years now is to not wait for government to decide, to not wait for bureaucratic relief, to just do it. And don't forget to join us right here on ABC 10 on January 1st, starting at 6 p.m. for our special Puerto Rico Rises with ABC 10's Lilia Luciano and Michael Anthony Adams. Lilia got to go back to her homeland, as you just saw, and she spoke with San Juan's mayor who called out President Trump for what she calls the slow and inefficient federal response after Hurricane Maria devastated the island.